Time for us to start, so I'm glad everybody's here. Now, there's a whole lot of space up here in the front. I, I really, I promise I won't bite anybody if they want to move up here. <laughs> I'm glad you're all here. We're going to start off our next quarter, continuing in the book of Isaiah this morning. So as we get started here this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Our Lord God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. You're the creator of the world, you're the creator of everything, you're the giver of life, and you've given us the hope of a second life through Jesus Christ, and we thank you so much for that. And we thank you as we look at your prophet Isaiah, and we look at so much of what he has to say this coming quarter about the Messiah to come in his time. The Messiah we know today is Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that prophet, and we thank you for the words of comfort that he gives us. Be with us now as we go into this word, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, did everyone get a handout? Uh, I emailed it out, but I also printed a bunch of copies, so there should be copies for everyone here that's here this morning if you don't have a handout. Now, I've been admonished that the first order of business this morning is to remind each and every one of you that tonight is an ice cream social, and that's really, really important. So I see a lot of potential ice cream makers out here, and if you want to bring Bluebell, that's okay. I like that, too. So we're looking forward to that. So let's get stu uh, started this morning as we look into the, to the book of Isaiah. And as I've started out the first half of this series, I always want to start, question, oh, you're looking for a handout? Okay, that's okay. I always want to start the study with a quote from the Psalms because Isaiah would have had the Psalms in his hand as he was a man of God and as he would have been studying and looking at God's word every day, he would have been reading these psalms. And I picked this Psalm 119 specifically this morning because it refers to comfort and it refers to a servant. And both of those are gonna come into very strong prominence as we begin this lesson from chapter 40 today and as we continue on through the next few chapters. Uh, it's kind of interesting too, I don't know if you know this about Psalm 119, it does not have an attribution as so many of the Psalms say, a Psalm of David, or a Psalm of Asaph, or a Psalm of Korah, or whatever. There's no attribution for Psalm 119. But most scholars believe that David wrote this. And that word servant is one of the key reasons people think David wrote this, because in David's Psalms, and only David's Psalms, does he refer to himself as a servant. And this is the only other Psalm that repeatedly uses the word servant even though it's not attributed to David. So anyway, Isaiah would have known this verse and it would have brought him comfort and he would have been thinking about the promise of the servant to come. So let's back up just a, just a hair. You know, Sean finished up last week. Uh, we were looking at the first part of Isaiah and he went up through Isaiah chapter 35 we're skipping over what's called the Chronicles of Hezekiah, which are Isaiah 36 through 39, because those are virtually word for word duplicates of what you can read in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. But if you read those, those Chronicles of Hezekiah, you would have seen the story we're very familiar with about how uh, the Assyrian king sent what's called in one book, the Rabshakeh, and another book, he's just named Rabshakeh, uh, and basically this man insulted God and he insulted God in front of Hezekiah's spokesman. He insulted God in writing. He challenged these people, insulted these people by saying, if I, if my king gives you 2000 horsemen, can you even find men to mount them? Uh, then we see what happens to the Syrian army because of that insult. 185,000 died in one night. Then we see as, as the Chronicles of Hezekiah end up, uh, envoys from Babylon come over and Hezekiah makes a big mistake and he shows them all the wealth of the temple, he shows them everything and Isaiah monitor, uh, admonishes him and said, you shouldn't have done that. But Hezekiah gets a promise that in his lifetime, he would not see captivity. Now Isaiah tells him, he said, your sons and sons of your sons 
are going to be taken into Babylonian captivity, and that ends uh, the Chronicles of Hezekiah. So now we start up on chapter 40, and it's, it's very remarkable here. His purpose from this point on is to preach peace and predict the future Israel of God, which is his church. Now, the book is remarkable here because I know we're all familiar with reading through the Bible and we read, start in chapter one and we go through whatever chapter, and in this case, there's 66 chapters. But there, the, the change in tone is so remarkable here. It's just as if Moses was writing Genesis and he finished Genesis and then he picked up the pen and said, okay, now I'm, now I'm gonna write Exodus. And it's a whole new book. Well, that's exactly what happens here. The tone is so dramatically different from the first 39 chapters. It's, it's, like a, it's like a whole new book. From this point forward, the book becomes intensely messianic. Now, he's made reference to the coming Messiah all along, and we, we looked at some of those scriptures. But now, there's specific scriptures here that are fulfilled specifically in the New Testament. And uh, it, it's just remarkable how these are not only fulfilled, they're even quoted in the New Testament. So in today's class, we're going to look at chapter 40. And we're going to see where Isaiah is going to be talking about the sovereign, majestic God, the God who comforts. In chapter 41, if we get to that, uh, he's going to be talking about the Lord who rules and remains faithful to his people during this whole time. Now, in verse 1, and I'll just read this, he says, Comfort, yes, comfort, my people, says your God. He begins to comfort his people. Now let me just take a pause right here because starting Wednesday night of this week, our summer series begins. And the whole theme of the restorate of the of the theme of uh, the summer is is beautiful concepts in the scripture of restoration. Uh, our first uh, Wednesday night class, a gentleman you may you may all know. <laughs> is going to travel all the way down from Salado. Uh, on Wednesday night, he's going to speak to us that night about the restoration movement. His name's Andy Jackson. Then each Wednesday night of the summer, our speakers will be coming in and will speak to us on one of the principles of restoration. Uh, it's just a coincidence because we ask each speaker to pick a date, pick a topic. But the very last Wednesday night of the summer, the speaker is going to be speaking about comfort. So as we wind up the whole book of Isaiah, as he's talking about the comfort we have in God, can have in God, we're going to end up with the last Wednesday night of the summer with a speaker talking to us about restoration of comfort. So we're looking forward to that. By the way, uh, we got a gentleman visiting here from Champions Church of Christ, and Bill, some of our speakers are the same as your speakers for the Wednesday night. <laughs> but they're not speaking on the same night, so that's, that's a good thing. So... Uh, he speaks about comfort here, and in verses 9 through 11, he's going to clearly proclaim his majesty, and he's going to say his word lasts forever. Let's just read those verses right quick. In verses 9 through 11, he says, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain of Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say to the cities of Judea, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold his reward is with him and his work before him. And then notice the change from ruler to shepherd. He says he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them down to his bosom and gently lead those with young. God is going to proclaim his majesty that his word lasts forever. And he's going to start in verse 12 beginning a, a bunch of rhetorical questions. And we're not going to have the time to go through those rhetorical questions to demonstrate the uniqueness of God. But in the very first word, verse that I read before when he says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God, the main purpose from this point through chapter 48 is that God is the God who comforts. And he uses that word 14 times in the whole book, but 12 times just in these few verses. So that tells us how important that word comfort is there. 
he uses that imperfect tense when he says, says your God. Now, it's important for us to understand the tenses of verbs because when he says, says your God, he said it 2,700 years ago when Isaiah wrote this. But that tense carries over to today. God is still saying to his people, Christians, comfort. And we have this wonderful verse from Paul in 2 Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So the message that Isaiah wrote 2,700 years ago is applicable today to us to have comfort. Now, this next verse in verse 2, I want to back up and read that right quick. He says, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double all her sins. I, I can't emphasize enough that phrase, speak tenderly. In fact, if I wanted to, I could spend the whole class just on those two words. But we just don't have time to do that. In all fairness to Sean, Sean's got to pick this up after six weeks and finish out Isaiah. So I can't spend the whole class just talking about that phrase. But I want to emphasize to you how important that phrase is. In your Bible, it may say, speak comfortably. It may speak kindly. Literally, the words are speak unto the heart. And what it says, speak to win someone over. Let me say that again. It says, speak to win someone over. I'll give you another example of where this is found in Scripture. And there are several examples, but this is one from Genesis chapter 50. Jacob had just passed away. And the sons of Jacob were in fear that Joseph would kill him now. Because after all, they had sold him into slavery, hadn't they? But Joseph came to those sons and says, Do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. He spoke to win them over. Now I'm going to do something here that I may step on some toes. But we see lots of teachers in the Bible that step on toes. So I guess it's okay for me to step on toes. Uh, does anybody know who that is? You seen that TV show, John Ankerberg show. You familiar with that? 30 years ago, roughly 30 years ago, John Ankerberg, and you can find this on YouTube, so I'm not gonna bother to play an hour and 20 minute video for you on YouTube, but John Ankerberg featured a debate between two of the leading professors of the largest denomination in the United States and two of the best professors at Harding University, Jerry Jones, Jimmy Allen. And the, if you want to watch that whole debate, it's fantastic. I mean, Jerry Jones, Jimmy Allen hit the nail on the head on every scripture. Acts 2.38, Galatians chapter 3, Romans chapter 6. Over and over and over again, they hit the nail on the head. At the end of the show, they asked the audience who won the debate. Guess who won? It wasn't Jerry Jones and it wasn't Jimmy Allen. Why do you think that was? Well, if you click on YouTube and you open up that video, if you turn off the screen or turn your back and you listen to the debate, you will be thoroughly convinced that Dr. Jerry Jones and Dr. Jimmy Allen won that debate. No, no doubt about it, hands down. But if you play it again and watch it, <laughs> things change. You won't see them crack a smile. You won't see them show any friendliness at all. In fact, at one point, one of the men from the denomination looks at Jimmy Allen and says, would you call me a Christian? And he turned his head and changed the subject. Now, that was a teaching moment. It was a fantastic teaching moment with a nationwide TV audience, but they missed it. And I'd submit to you if they did that debate again today, but if they had Furman Carpenter and they had Brian Davis on that stage, it'd be a wholly different output, outcome because they would be speaking to 
kindly speaking to win someone over. God gave us, Jesus gave us the Great Commission. He didn't say, go into all the world and debate. He said, go into the whole world and make disciples. And you don't make disciples debating with a frown on your face. You make disciples by doing what Jesus said to Nicodemus. For God so loved the world. That's how you start. And unfortunately, the brightest, best teachers that we had missed that opportunity. And these are great men, fantastic, no doubt about it. But they missed a wonderful opportunity. Now let's go on and just look at uh, verse 3. Because this verse is quoted in every gospel of the Bible. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You know, I had a preacher tell me a long time ago that every scripture is important. But when the Holy Spirit decides it needs to be in every one of the gospels, it's really, really important. And we see uh, this scripture from Isaiah quoted in all four of the gospels. And then we see the angel of the Lord coming to John, uh, the father of John the Baptist, Zechariah, and he said these words in Luke chapter 1. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And this is exactly what our charge is. Going back to that great commission to make disciples of the whole world, we make ready a people prepared. We don't go up to a stranger and say, okay, jump in the water, you need to be baptized. Is that preparing anyone? You've got to prepare them. And that's exactly what uh, John the Baptist did. In verse 5, we'll go, I'll go, let me go back and read that. It says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I can't emphasize enough how important that concept is, is the glory of the Lord probably one of the most important concepts in the entire Bible that we can take to the world. We've got to teach new disciples in fulfilling the Great Commission is to use Scripture to reveal the glory of the Lord. If you ask someone to repent, why should they repent if they don't know who God is? Why should they repent if they don't understand that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lord and King of Kings? If they can't accept that fact, then you're, you're hitting a wall trying to make a disciple. So you've got to reveal the glory of the Lord to people and use the scripture to do that. Now, I put that picture up there. This is just a personal thing. <laughs> you see what I'm seeing up there? You see a car with its backup lights on and the other car doesn't have its backup lights on. You know, I guess things have changed. I mean, when I would took driver's ed, you know, I was always told, if a car starts to back up, you stop. That's the rule. Uh, we had family in Oklahoma and some of the small towns in Oklahoma, and Bill, you probably know this because you're from Oklahoma, but a lot of these small towns on Main Street, they had angle parking in the middle of the street. Can you imagine that? And so if you're driving into town on Saturday morning, you see all these cars parked in the middle of the street. If one of them started to back out, you stopped. That's the rule, right? Well, apparently, rules change. Because if you start backing up right now at HEB, somebody's going to accelerate behind you. <laughs> and, and it's a scary experience. Well, some things change and some things don't change. But in verses 6 through 8, Peter quoted Isaiah here saying, All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fall, fails, falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. God's word remains unchanged. There's nobody going to say, well, you can back up today, but you can't back up tomorrow, or you should stop. It's going to be the same. Now, before I put this next photograph up there, I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you are holding the King James Bible? Real popular, isn't it? I want to show you a picture. Can you see that? That photograph is a group of lady priests from the Church of England. The Church of England gave all of us the King James Bible. 
1611, when that Bible was published, would have you have seen these lady priestesses in that church? And it also struck me that they're all smiling, but not a single one of them is holding the Bible. Now, when Furman stands up here every Saturday, or Sunday morning and preaches a sermon, he holds out that Bible the very first thing and said, this is what we believe. This is it. We believe what's in here. What changed between 1611 and 2000 when they began ordaining priests, lady priests into that church? God's word didn't change. We're told that to give heed to that which is permanent, which is the word of God. Now, a denomination may change the rules. They can get together in a convention and vote one way or the other and change the rules. But can you change God's word? Nothing can change God's word. And that, that's why it's important that we always stay with God's word. Now, in verses 9 through 11, he says, Go up to a high mountain, Zion, speaking of Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news, lift it up, fear not, say to the cities, behold your God. Say it again, the, the awesomeness of God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with him. That's a scripture that I read a while ago, and I want to emphasize it again. God is going to be pictured as a mighty ruler, strength in his arms, yet a gentle shepherd. Zion and Jerusalem are the proclaimers of the good news here. And what's being proclaimed? What's he saying? Behold your God. Literally the word he's using here is Adonai Yahweh, which is the Lord Jehovah in power. And that's who God is. And he's telling us and everyone to proclaim that. Adonai Yahweh is the central point of the message of hope and comfort. He started out by saying comfort, and this brings it home. God has not abandoned his people. The same God who protects his people with his mighty arm gathers his people in his arms like a shepherd. We know this from the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. We know from John 10 verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. We know from John 10, verse 14, where he says, continuing on, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. That's who Jesus Christ is. He is our great shepherd. And this is the same shepherd that Isaiah is speaking of in these verses. So verses 9 through 11 is the Messiah and his kingdom. His focus is on the church. Is what he's talking about here. That's you and me, what we have here. And we see this in Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 15 has three parables, by the way. And all three of those parables focus on God. And this is one of the most familiar of those parables. He says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So that's God. That's Jesus Christ, our shepherd. His rejoicing in the repentance of just a single sinner. And, and we all, when we became Christians, when we all were baptized, when we rose from that watery grave in, in, of baptism, Jesus was rejoicing over each and every one of us because he knew us by name. In verses 12 through 31, I won't read that, but he's going to be talking about the greatness of God. In verse 12, 12 and I'll, I'll go back to this in just a second. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance? Now, I sent out a challenge yesterday, and I asked for two responses. One, if anyone, you could do this on Google, tell me the surface area of the earth in square miles. And the second question was, what in the world does this have to do with the book of Isaiah? I didn't get a single response back. <laughs> so 
So you either didn't get my challenge or maybe you thought, what in the world is this guy doing now? But did anyone look that up? Know how many, what the surface area of the earth is? Nobody looked it up. Have any idea what that would have to do with the book of Isaiah? Do we have any geologists in here? Regular geologists, petroleum geologists, no geologists. Okay. Well, let me introduce you to a term. This is 2,700 years ago. Isaiah, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, introduced the ge geophysical principle of isostasy. Have you ever heard of that? Have any idea what he's talking about there? Well, I think this is very important because when we realize what the Holy Spirit tells us in the Bible, it can help us understand a whole lot about creation. He uses that phrase, the dust of the earth, and, he, and I underline this, a measure and weigh the mountains and scales and hills in balance. And that's what astostasy is. Astostasy is a geophysical principle that says the land mass of the earth is an exact equilibrium with the water mass of the earth. And God made it that way. Of course, the geologist may not say that God made it that way. I'll tell you that God made it that way. Uh, he uses that phrase, the dust of the earth, which most of your translations translate it that way. It's actually the Hebrew word shalish. Literally, it means a third. It means a third. What is the significance of that? Well, I put this little map of what the earth looks like. See the crust? That's what I'm standing on here, what you and I are sitting on. That's that little thin layer, outer layer of the earth. In some areas, it's only 15 miles deep, but in other areas, it's, it's much deeper. Below that is what's called the mantle. Well, you see there North America, South America. You can see part of Africa there. Earth's crust consists of water and land. The land covers... 57,584,000 square miles. That's exactly one third of the surface of the earth. The other two thirds is covered by water. So 2,700 years ago, I mean a long time before Columbus sailed the ocean blue, a long time before Magellan and his crew circumnavigated the earth, Isaiah, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us that all the land masses of the earth are one third of the earth's surface. And that's pretty remarkable because we didn't discover that until we started sending satellites up there and we could start measuring things. So anyway, he asked the question, who else but God? And I made a note here, the greatest thinkers in history, and there were some really great thinkers, I mean, Chaldeans, Greeks, Romans, we can go back and read some of the things that they wrote. None of them conceived of such a lofty concept of man's origins or of God, the way that Isaiah begins to describe God here. None of them can do that. But by revelation, Isaiah revealed to God's people the magnificent transcendence of God. And who are we? We're God's people. He's showing us today the transcendence of God. I'll skip ahead a few chapters. This is stealing from Sean because he'll get to this later on in the summer. But in Isaiah 64, he says, From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. Have you heard that phrase before? No perceived by the ear, no eye has seen. Let me look at, show you this scripture from 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writing here. It says, But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. Remember I mentioned the Chaldeans, the Greeks, the Romans, all the other rulers, none of them understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who loved him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God's. And Paul's quoting here Isaiah 64 as well as parts of Isaiah 65. So that's telling us this wonderful transition of God that no other culture had ever imagined. And he says in verse 18, To whom then will you liken God or what 
likeness compare with him? Now, he's going to be going on to here, and we're not going to spend time to read it, but uh, to talk about the futility of idols. I mean, these people uh, had begun to make idols. That's one of the reasons that God was going to send them off into captivity is because they had forsaken him for the sake of handmade uh, idols. I found this quote from a gentleman by the name of John Oswald. He says, if God's transcendence is the most fundamental truth of Old Testament theology, its immediate corollary is the next most fundamental. One cannot make an image of God. And what do we have in the very first two commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. That's number one. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. No idols. And this gentleman, Edward J. Young, wrote this. Isaiah's question brings us to the heart of genuine theism. There can be no comparison between the living, eternal God and any man. For man is but a creature. And he goes on quite a few more sentences, so I broke it apart. To break down this distinction is to fall into the sin of idolatry. And that's the one thing, and we'll look at further on later when we get into it, but God absolutely abhors idolatry and calls it an abomination. If we read 19 through 24, and I think I'll just go ahead and do that because I want you to hear the sarcasm he has in here. He says, the workman molds an image, the goldsmith spreads it with gold, the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Had has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sets above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth when he will also blow on them and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away for stubble. God shows absolute, utter contempt for these idols that people were making, uh, whether a metal or, or whether made of wood. Uh, skipping a, a few chapters ahead, he writes this in chapter 45. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other beside me. There is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know, and from the rising of the sun and from the west, there is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. That pretty well says it all. In verse 28, he uses this phrase, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. He's, his understanding is unsearchable. In a single sentence, in that one single sentence, Isaiah brings home this whole message of comfort that he started out with in verse 1 when he says, comfort, comfort, says the Lord. In that sentence, he tells them that God is eternal. He tells them that God is the creator. And he tells them that God understands his covenant relationship with his people. Only God can do this. No idol could even imagine doing that. In verses 29 through 30, and let me go ahead and read that. He says, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young man shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I know that's a very familiar scripture that, to many of us because we've heard that before. But he uses that word, kivah, for those who wait for the Lord. And that word also means to trust and to hope in the Lord. So we're not only waiting, but at the same time we're trusting. At the same time we're hoping. And that's what we do. Those who wait on the Lord, who trust in the Lord, who hope in the Lord, those people, his people, Christians, 
It says, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Have you ever thought about how, how high an eagle can fly? Any ideas? Any guesses? Well, I've seen photographs of eagles taking down cranes over the Himalayas. And the Himalayas are pretty high mountains, aren't they? Uh, I used to fly a plane in the Air Force that uh, we regularly flew at 30 to 35,000 feet altitude. One of our planes, and I thank the Lord I wasn't on that plane, but they took a direct hit through the windshield one time from a bird at 27,000 feet. That bird went through seven inches of plexiglass. And the crew was okay, and they went ahead and landed the plane, and then the biologists examined the remains of what was still in the cockpit, and it was a trumpeter swan. Had you ever thought that a trumpeter swan could fly at 27,000 feet? And an eagle flies higher than that because they can catch them. But God is going to lift us up symbolically like that eagle to a, a height that we just can't imagine. And, he, and the weakest among us, the very weakest among us, uh, the aged, the elderly, the sick, he's going to give us strength. And I just can't, I can't emphasize enough what God can do for all of us, especially those that are weak among us. The one who depends on the Lord, that person is the one who's strong. And Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. That, that's an incredible statement that all of us are going to reach some point in our life where we're not very strong anymore. Uh, we're going to be getting weaker and weaker as we get to a certain point in age. And yet God's power is going to be in us to make us strong. We can still have a wonderful prayer life. We can still encourage those around us. Uh, there was a couple we lit when we lived in West Texas. Uh, they were an aged couple, Jack and Francis Scott. And he could not get around it without a walker. He had had surgery and his, had, they clipped a nerve in his back and his legs were useless. And they had a mission. And you better be ready for it. But at 7.30 on the morning of your birthday, whether you were awake or not, Jack and Francis would call you and when you answered the phone, they started singing happy birthday. Now, they couldn't get to church and they couldn't, they weren't as active as they were, but they had a mission and they could do that. They could encourage everyone in the church just by singing happy birthday on their birthday. So we all knew that when our birthday was coming up, don't sleep in <laughs> because Jack and Francis are going to call you. But that's what we can do even when we reach a point in our lives where we're infirm. And then of course we have this wonderful scripture from Paul writing from prison, you know, in captivity and, you know, prison cells today are luxury compared to what cells were back then. Basically, it was either a hole in the ground or a cave that they kept people in. And he may have, in fact, even been shackled to one of the guards while he was writing this. But in that condition, he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so we have that same hope in us, that same trust in us, that uh, waiting on God that Isaiah is writing about here in verses 29 through 30. Now we'll try to get into chapter 41. I know we're not going to finish this up, but there's no timeline for me to finish except to hand this over to Sean in six weeks. So we'll get there. You have a question? Well, that, you might have heard, she's, what she said was she had heard that an eagle can rise up over a storm. Well, storms get pretty high. <laughs> uh, I flew an a plane in the Air Force that at one time had a world record time to climb from zero to 60,000 feet in 60 seconds. That's pretty fast. A test pilot one day was flying one of those planes, and he was at 40,000 feet. Ahead of him, he saw, he was going towards St. Louis, Missouri, he saw a thunderstorm building up ahead of him. And so he said, I'll fly over it. Now, remember, this plane could go from zero to 60,000 feet in 60 seconds. 
He stood it on its tail, pushed in the afterburners, rolled, well, had rolled out upside down, then he turned, inverted it 50,000 feet. He did, that happened in 15 seconds. The storm was 20,000 feet higher than he was. So I, I don't think an eagle can fly at 70,000 feet. <laughs> Probably couldn't breathe there, but that's how high a storm can get. I mean, that's, that's a powerful force in nature. But an eagle certainly has a capability to fly over a smaller storm, you know, no doubt about that. But anyway, that's just a side story. So we'll get into chapter 41. Uh, the whole theme of chapter 41 here, I put it all up here. The Lord rules, remains faithful to his people. God summons his people to recognize him as the sovereign Lord who would provide for them. God's going to be proclaimed as the ruler of the world, the first and the last. And it's going to be emphasized here that only God can predict the future. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, so amazing. I'll just skip ahead and show you a little bit of what he's going to say. He's going to call a man by name. 175 years before the fact, he's going to call a man by name. And we're going to see that uh, fulfilled in history. The very first verse of chapter 41 I'll read that. It says, keep silence before me, O coastlands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near. Let them speak. I will come near together for judgment. And I found this image. You know, when we look at judgment, we have any lawyers here? Uh, when we think of judgment today, we think of blind justice holding the scales. She always says, say a scales in one arm and a sword in the other and she's blind, she's blindfolded. That comes back from a Roman concept that Emperor Augustus put in. But I found this one because on these scales, there's, there's no blindfold. There's no blindfold in God's justice. He is not blind. Verse, verses two through seven, and we won't have time to read it, but it sets up a trial scene. God is the judge, God is the jury, God is the bailiff, God is the prosecutor, God summons the court. God makes the case. God declares the verdict. He's not blind. The scriptures here tell us everything we need to know about salvation. We're not blind. We should know exactly what we need to do. God is not blind. God's going to declare that verdict. Now, as we get into verse 8, uh, in the last couple minutes that we have here, He's going to say, but you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendant of Abraham, my friend. This is where Isaiah introduces the concept of servant in this book. Now, it's important as you read and study through Isaiah that you identify who that servant is. Now, here he clearly says, you, Israel, are my servant. Now, as we get into later chapters, uh, starting next week, as a matter of fact, the servant is going to be by implication and by the context of what is saying. Clearly, that's the Messiah. There's no doubt about that. But here he's specifically saying, you, Israel, are my servant. He uses that word servant 13 times between here and uh, chapter 48. Seven times the word servant is parallel with the word chosen. God specifically states that Israel is his chosen servant here. And we see this going all the way back to Leviticus. He said, it's for his, it is to me that the people of Israel are servants. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of the Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So here he's declaring to Israel, you're my servants. Now he's about to send them into Babylonian captivity, but they're still his servants. And then he uses this phrase here in verse 8, where God calls Abraham my servant friend. And we'll end up this lesson just talking about this verse uh, so we have time to go to the second service. But there's only three times in scripture where Abraham is called the friend of God. In 2 Chronicles 20 verse 7, we see King Jehoshaphat talking to the people in a prayer to God and he calls Abraham my friend. In James chapter 2, verses 23, James calls Abraham God's friend. And here, Isaiah calls Abraham my friend. 
Now the question I have is how does the scripture describe you and me? What are we to God? In John chapter 15, Christ said this, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus tells his disciples, he tells us, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful concept that we can know that Christ is not only our savior, he's our friend. And we'll, we'll stop right here. There's a ho whole lot more in chapter 41. We'll pick that up next week. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, does anyone want to know how high a sparrow can fly? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think they can fly very high because that hawk in my neighborhood gets them pretty regular. Let's, let's close with one more word of prayer then. Lord God and Father in heaven, thank you again for your servant Isaiah. Thank you for the fact that we know that uh, Christ is our friend. Thank you for those wonderful words of him that you are our God. You are God Almighty. You are Adonai Yahweh, the, the, the one, the first, and the last, and what a wonderful Lord you are. Lord, as we continue on now, we'll be going into our second service, and we'll be worshiping you and lifting our voices in praise to you. And we pray, Lord, that you hear our prayers to you, that we worship you in spirit and truth. And we look forward to that gospel proclamation, Lord, that we hear this morning, and we pray that if this is anyone today has not obeyed that gospel that this would be the day thank you for jesus thank you for his love thank you that we love because you first loved us for it's in jesus name we pray amen